So here I've sketched out the classic pain pathway that you might be familiar with from the previous video. There's an initial set, uh, stimulation of the nociceptors and these generate a new nerve impulse. So the pain pathway starts there and the generation of the new nerve impulse is called transduction. But then this has to be conducted up the sensory nerve into the spinal cord across the synapses in the relay neuron in the spinal cord. This is the conduction of the nerve impulse. It goes across to the other side, this process of decusation. It goes up the spinothalamic tract, through the brain stem, into the thalamus. And it's the thalamus that generates the pain, so this is the perception stage. It's transmitted up here conduction. We need transmission first, so we've got conduction transmission. The transmission is going all the way up here through this pathway, up to the thalamus. And then the perception is also facilitated by the localization in the sensory cortex, in the sensory homunculus. So we've got the conduction, the transmission, and the thalamus generating the pain and telling us where it is, the perception. But there's also modulation, there's descending impulses come from the brain. And they go down and they modulate the way that this pathway transmits pain to the brain. So it's quite complicated really, and this is just a spinal example, there's the cranial nerves as well, which work in a, a similar way, but of course don't go via the spinal cord. So that's the normal pathway we're familiar with. The pain begins with the transduction of the tissue damage at the level of the nociceptors. And we're familiar with many things like, can cause this sort of pain, mechanical things, cutting, stretching, heat, cold, chemicals, inflammatory chemicals, post-operative, post-traumatic. All of these things will affect the nociceptors. And the whole point of this system is that it warns us about the tissue damage. That impulse is conducted, transmitted, this perception, and there's modulation to make sure the pain is appropriate. So that's all normal. But can you see that what could happen is that the pain is actually generated by the thalamus. So suppose this nerve fiber was generating a, a nerve impulse when it shouldn't, then that would still go up this pathway. Or suppose the spinal cord was developing nerve impulses when it shouldn't, that would still go up this pathway. In fact, any place on this pain pathway could lead to electrical nerve impulses going up to the thalamus, which the thalamus would interpret as pain. So nociceptive pain is generated by the nociceptors, neuropathic pain is generated by the, the pain system, this transmitting conducting system. So neuropathic pain is pain caused by damage to or disease of the somatosensory system. Somato body, sensory, how we come become aware of the body. And it's quite common, about 7% of the population at some time suffer from neuropathic pain. And it can be a long term type of pain, it can be ongoing. So the system is supposed to respond to nociceptive pain. Nociceptors are found in the dermis, the muscles, the connective tissues, the cornea. The periosteum and endosteum, the periosteum round the bone, the endosteum in the bone, in the medullary cavity. The parietal and uh, the parietal pleura and parietal peritoneal membranes are very sensitive to pain, as are the synovial capsules, as you'll know if you've ever dislocated anything. So but that's all normal, that, that's warning us about damage to the body nociceptic. But if the pain impulse is starting anywhere else along the pathway, or if the electrical nerve impulse is starting anywhere else along the pathway, that can still go up and be interpreted as pain, because it's the thalamus up here that generates the pain. So, what can cause nociceptic pain? We know that. Next question, what can cause neuropathic pain? Well, many things. 
So there can be infections such as shingles affecting the peripheral nerve. And this is an important distinction in some ways because the neuropathic pain can be peripheral or it can be central in the nervous system. So if it affects the peripheral nervous system, it's peripheral. The central nervous system, it's central neuropathic pain. So shingles can cause post-herpatic neuralgia, very painful condition. Herpatic because the shingles is caused by the herpes zoster virus. Or there can be nerve trapping. There could be physical pressure on a nerve. Slip disc, for example, or carpal tunnel syndrome, causing physical pressure on a nerve. And diabetes, alcohol, HIV and vitamin B deficiencies can all cause peripheral neuropathy, neuropathy, disease of the peripheral nerves. And these diseases of the peripheral nerves mean they can start generating nerve impulses when they're not supposed to, and they will go up this pain pathway and be interpreted as pain. Phantom limb pain is a classic neuropathic pain. Because imagine that you have your hand chopped off, that bit's all gone. But you're not feeling your hand in your hand, you're feeling it in the sensory cortex of the brain. And of course, if that limb is amputated, that, that limb is still present in the sensory cortex. As indeed are the pathways in the spinal cord that go up to that area of the sensory cortex. So phantom pain could be caused anywhere along this pathway as well. And we'll still feel it, even though part of the body is no longer physically present because it's there in the sensory cortex. Neuropathic pain can complicate stroke, chronic inflammation and cancer can cause it, sometimes by physical pressure on a nerve from the tumour. And chemotherapy can also cause neuropathic pain. Now, how are we going to recognise this neuropathic pain? Well, it's um, disproportionate to the tissue injury and it tends to go on for a long time. And it can be constant or paroxysmal. Constant means it will be there all the time. Paroxysmal means it will come and go. And these are giveaway words, really. Burning, stabbing, shooting, lanceating. In trigeminal neuralgia, the pain is described as lanceating. It just seems to go through the face. There may often be numbness as well, tingling, pins and needles type feeling, electrical sensations. All indicators that the pain could be neuropathic. And two classic features are anesthesia dolorosa. So this is the epidermis here. This is the dermis with the nociceptor. Now, if an area of the skin uh, is not sensitive to touch, the person can't feel it, it's uh, anaesthetized but they still have pain, that's anesthesia dolorosa, and that's classic of neuropathic pain. And the other one that is classic is allodynia. Allodynia is where very light touch will stimulate pain. So just touching the surface of the skin will be interpreted as a, as a painful stimulus. So we've thought about the causes and the features of neuropathic pain. How are we going to manage it? Well, we know how to manage nociceptic pain with our paracetamol, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, opiates, nitrous oxide. But very often these analgesics don't work for neuropathic pain. And this is why it's so important to distinguish between nociceptive and neuropathic because the nociceptic typical anaesthetic drugs, or um, not anaesthetic, analgesic drugs, they usually don't work for neuropathic pain. We need separate treatments. And neuropathic pain can take a while to treat. It can take a few weeks to get the pain under control. If possible, treat the underlying cause. But very often we might give amitriptyline, which is a tricyclic, or duloxetine, which is a serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. Noradrenaline and norepinephrine are the same thing. And these are increasing the amount of norepinephrine and the amount of serotonin in the synapses in various places. 
perhaps not so much in this pathway, but these are synapses, perhaps more in the analgesic pathways that are inhibiting the pain. So a completely different treatment to the normal analgesics used in uh, nociceptive pain. Gabapentin and pregabalin are anticonvulsants, actually. They affect the amount of GABA in the chemical, the, the amount of the chemical transmitter substance GABA, G-A-B-A. -A. And GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, gamma aminobutyric acid. So modulating the amount of these neurotransmitters in the central nervous system can reduce the amount of neuropathic pain. It can take a while to titrate these. So for example, amitriptyline and pregabalin can be given together. Deloxetine is a very good example, for example, in a diabetic neuropathy. Carbamazepine is another anticonvulsant. It works in a different way. It stabilizes the nerve fibers as well as working on the synapses. It actually works on the sodium channels, stabilizing the nerve fibers. So if you imagine a situation where the fibers in the spinal cord were generating nerve impulses when they weren't supposed to, these will go up to the thalamus and be interpreted as pain. So if we can stabilize the, these nerve fibers. That can be uh, very effective. So the carbamazepine does that, and it's particularly useful in trigeminal neuralgia, which of course is transmitted to the brain via the trigeminal nerve, one of the cranial nerves. Tramadol uh, also affects the uh, neurotransmitters. So it's good for managing um, acute pain, acute um, neuropathic pain. Tramadol is an opiate as well, of course, so we don't want to give it for too long. So but we can give it for rescue therapy because it has this double effect. It has an opiate effect and it also affects the neurotransmitters. And a new treatment is capsaicin cream. This is put on the surface of the painful area and it diffuses through the skin and affects the... It actually affects the substance P, which is one of the things that influences um, nerve activity. Cap capsaicin is what is in chili peppers. It's why your mouth goes numb with uh, chili peppers. We give a very low concentration, 0.075% cream. So we see the management is completely different because the cause of the pain is different. The nociceptive pain is, is the proper pain, if you like, warning the body against injury. Whereas the neuropathic pain often becomes chronic, serves no purpose, but we need to get rid of it by working on the central nervous system. By working on these ascending fibres and the inhibitory pain pathways that are coming back down. Because remember we said that pain can be modulated. So the brain knows when it's sometimes inappropriate to feel pain and there's modulatory pathways come back down. For example, there's a modulatory pathway coming down here that will inhibit the afferent fibers or the afferent impulses going through the spinal cord. So these drugs for neuropathic pain are working in a completely different way. These neuralgic type of pains. Also, bear in mind, we'll get the physiotherapists. If acupuncture works, that's fine. Nerve blocks can be useful sometimes, using lignocaine. And uh, percutaneous electrical nerve stimulation would put an electrode through the skin into the area of nerves and put an electrical current through there. And transcutaneous, the TENS, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, the electrodes would be on the surface of the body. And remember, this is about the whole person. Stress, anxiety and depression all make pain worse. So manage these things. Look after the whole person. But remember to distinguish between the nociceptic pain which is useful, warning about tissue damage. We still need to treat it because it's painful. In fact, if we don't treat uh, nociceptive pain, if it's ongoing for a long period of time, that can generate changes in the spinal cord, which can lead to neuropathic pain. But we must know about the difference because the treatment for the nociceptic and the neuropathic are different.